Yes, uh, um, it's an it's an absolute uh, pleasure, an absolute treat that we're going to have today. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Martin Jones. Martin is deputy head of microscopy prototyping in the uh, electron microscopy science technology platform at the Francis Crick Institute in London, UK. Uh, his team uh, is is focusing on developing new hardware and software for dealing with big data produced in modern microscopy, particularly in uh, volume electron microscopy and correlative light electron microscopy. Martin originally trained as a physicist with a doctorate in experimental atomic physics from the Sussex University. He moved to biology in 2010 to work in the vascular biology lab at the Cancer Research UK, working on uh, microscope development and image analysis. From there, he joined the Cancer Research UK electron microscopy unit, which migrated later to the new Crick building in 2016. Martin is the chair of the Royal Microscopy Society's new data analysis and imaging section, and contributes to computational education at the Crick and is also a co-founder of the Crick Data Challenge, which hopefully he's going to tell us all about today in his today's talk. Uh, with this, and uh, without any further ado, Martin, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, so let me just share my desktop. Oh, sorry, it's asking me to authorize. I've got a new computer. I should have. Should no have checked worries. this when I was chatting to no uh, Arta earlier. Bear with me. Got one of these new uh, Macs with the um, uh, M1 chip. Uh, okay, it's asking me to quit and reopen, so I might drop out and rejoin. Bear with me. Sorry. That's fair enough. Please go ahead. In the meanwhile, I think we have a little bit of more people joining and uh, hopefully no one's going to miss the talk. Okay, uh, we've got Martin joining again. It was a good start. Let me try that again. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, let's go. It's always the uh, the people who work in high tech who can't panic <laughs> systems, isn't it? Uh, okay. Let's try that. <laughs> it's coming up. It's coming up. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, so um, thanks very much for the invite. So I've known Arthur for a few years now, so I've roped him into various events at the Crick with our AI club and data challenge. I wasn't actually going to talk about a data challenge, but we can chat about it later if it's um, something you're interested in. Um, okay, so let me give a bit of an introduction to the Crick. So uh, being in the Crick, we sort of think that everybody knows about it, but I think we've discovered that maybe not, not everyone around the world has quite uh, noticed this enormous new building that's popped up in the in the middle of London. Um, it's a bio, what, what Sir Paul Nurse calls a, a biomedical discovery institute, and we, its research is mostly on biology of human health and disease. It's based in London, right next to St Pancras, which is very good for getting to Europe. Obviously, some political things have happened since the Crick was built that's made some of that a bit more challenging. But um, anyway, you can get to us uh, on the Eurostar nice and easily. And I think one of the founding principles is that this sort of science needs not just biologists, it needs physicists and mathematicians and computer scientists to develop the new technologies as well as to, to, to do the biology. Uh, we're uh, funded largely by Cancer Research UK, Wellcome Trust and Medical Research Council. And we have three university partners, King's College London, University College London and Imperial College London. Uh, we're about 1500 people in one building. So it's, it's a rather large institute. I think there's about 120 research groups and about maybe 20 um, core facilities, something like that. 
Okay, so let's get started with uh, the science. So um, I, I gather this is a potentially quite interdisciplinary audience. So apologies if I'm teaching you uh, very basics here, but I wanted to start from, from the very beginning. Um, in biology, we often want to image things. And here's a, a range of different scales, right? You go all the way from these small molecules that do all the jobs in the cell through proteins and um, viruses and mitochondria. And at school, you probably did some microscopy. Um, it's normally light microscopy. And the, the things you can see with that sort of technology are of a few hundred nanometers and upwards, really. So be anything smaller than that, the light microscope just can't see. So that's why we do um, electron microscopy. So it's a really nice visualization of that here. Um, so this guy here is uh, an amphipod. So it's a couple of millimeters long. Um, you can fish one out of your pond. This is a, a diatom, which is, uh, I think, an algae. And then this is a bacterium. And so if you look at the scale here, this is of the order of a few hundred nanometers. If you were to look at this in an, uh, a light microscope, uh, you would see something ooh, like this. So this is the pixel size of a typical light microscope. So that's, that's why we use electron microscopes. So there's different types of electron microscopes. Uh, so broadly split into two, but there's lots of subdivisions. Uh, there's something called a scanning electron microscope where you put your sample in an electron beam that you focus down to a point, and then you scan that point across the surface in like a raster scan. So the same way that you read a book, you start in one corner, you read across the line, you go to the next line and you keep scrolling down until you've assimilated all of the information on that 2D slice, then you can look at another 2D slice. And that gives this sort of really nice uh, PR friendly um, image. So it looks 3D, it's not really, it's just kind of a like a photograph. So it's like a projection of, of a 3D object in 2D. And you, you can only look at the outside of your sample. Uh, the other broad type of electron microscopy is transmission EM. So here the sample is put in the middle of the electron beam. The beam goes through like a torch and you kind of look at the shadow. Uh, and to do that, you need to cut really thin slices. Uh, the way we do this is we take the, the sample, embed it in something super hard like resin or ice. Uh, and then you use a really sharp, very expensive diamond knife to cut a really thin slice. So typically 70 nanometers, something like this. So if you just tried to do this with a wet cell, it would just fall apart. So this is why we need it embedded in something very hard. Then you take that slice, put it in an electron beam, Beam of electrons come hit the surface, go through, and then the beam gets attenuated in some places more than others. And what you see behind is the shadow of the, the dense regions of that slice of the sample. So what that looks like is this. Uh, so this is a, a single slice through a dividing cell. So you can see the nucleus kind of more or less split into two here. And you can see this uh, you can see mitochondria, you can see endoplasmic reticulum, you can see all sorts of interesting substructures, but it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the cell. Um, it's looking at the inside of the cell now, which is great. Um, but both of these methods are really just kind of 2D or quasi, quasi 2, 2.5D, two something like that. Um, but there's new methods that have been around for maybe a decade or so now, where you can uh, use combinations of these technologies to image things genuinely in three dimensions. Uh, one of the workhorse systems that we use for this is something called uh, serial block face scanning electron microscope. And the way that works is it's a scanning EM, so it does this raster scan over the surface, but it incorporates the diamond knife that you'd use to prepare transmission EM samples now lives within the microscope so once you've taken your first image of the surface, then you just run the knife across it and you cleave away a small amount, and then you take the next image and so on. And this is completely automated. Uh, this is a commercial system um, that we have from Gatan, but there are other methods like focused iron beam SEM that we also use. Uh, and the data you get from this, so this is, each of these is a single cell. Uh, you can see the nucleus and the mitochondria in each. This is going 50 nanometers at a time with five nanometer pixel resolution through, I think there's about 10 cells in this one overnight acquisition. 
And at the end, end of a run like this, you've got this kind of block of data. And this is the problem that we have. So these, these are quite large amounts of data. Uh, if we're imaging between five and 50 nanometers per slice, we can do a thousand slices a night. Um, each slice is typically 60 to 100 megapixels in um, size. Uh, we normally do this with kind of overnight runs, maybe a few days. There are some labs in the world who do this for months at a time, and they're, they're getting into sort of multiple terabytes per data set for that sort of acquisition. So really huge amounts of data. Okay, so th the first rule of big data club, and I uh, suggest it, 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 big data has become a bit of a badge of honor that people say, ah, oh, my data is bigger and I've turned all of these dials up to 11 and I've got all of this, you know, I've got more data than you. And um, the first rule is don't get big data if you don't have to. It's, it's enormously expensive in disks. It's enormously expensive in PhD students' time trying to analyze the data. People don't realize how much it costs to store this data. So a thousand terabytes, which is you know, a petabyte, this number might be slightly out of, out of date, but it's probably ballpark right. Um, once you've got a few petabytes of data, you're looking at a million pounds of hard disks. So it's very expensive. If you can halve it and say to your IT department, I can save you $500,000, you know, you'd be uh, very popular with them. So uh, yeah, it's don't get big data unless you have to. Everyone likes to turn their microscope up to the maximum settings. Um, you don't always need it. And actually, a lot of the analysis that we want to do is um, something that you might term finding a needle in a haystack. So there's one rare thing that occurs in this huge volume of data, and I only care about that. I don't really care about all the rest. And I just have to sift through the rest to find it. So um, haystackology. Um, so there, there's a few approaches you can take to finding a needle in a haystack. So you can make the needle easy to spot. Uh, make your haystack smaller, so get less data, or develop some magic system that processes haystacks very efficiently. Uh, and before I go on to the uh, more analysis-based side of things, I just want to quickly talk about how we approach these first two. Uh, and it's using something called uh, multi-scale correlative imaging, uh, particularly one we use a lot is correlative light and electron microscopy. Um, so you know, I, I said electron microscopy is better than light microscopy at the start. It, it's not, not necessarily better, it's different. It gives you different information. It gives you all of the structure in the cell, whether you want to see it or not. What fluorescence microscopy can give you is functional information. So I, I've tagged the nucleus. So the only thing I see are the nuclei in this image. So I know that the thing I'm looking at is the thing that performs this particular function. Um, and we can combine these two in, in clever ways to um, only acquire the bits that we're interested in. So only point the electron microscope at the bits you want to image in ultra high resolution rather than imaging everything and trying to sort it out later. And, and this involves a lot of work in um, developing new sample preparation techniques and combinations of imaging devices. Um, I'll just quickly show you one of the imaging devices we've built, but there, there are many, many different approaches um, being developed around the world. Uh, and we, we built a, an integrated light and volume EM system. So this uh, serial block face SEM that I showed you before, um, the gap between the sample and the detector is about three millimeters, so it's quite small. Um, but we've managed to build something we called the miniature light microscope, a uh, very catchy name. Uh, that, uh, so this is the inside of this microscope. The red dot here is looking down this arrow. So that's the sample. Um, this is the diamond knife that moves across the block to um, cleave away these very thin layers. And the bit we've added is this um, underneath this block here. So it's a tiny, tiny little lens with a turning mirror that um, moves with the knife. So when we're cutting, so we take a, an electron image and then we come across, we cut a tiny bit off the surface. Then we move the light microscope in, we take an image of the surface from the fluorescence that we see, we take an EM image and repeat. And the idea of this is rather than having to image the whole area every time in EM, just so we don't risk missing something we're interested in, uh, we can identify the functionally interesting thing 
uh, do some kind of basic computation to work out where that object of interest is. Uh, then we can um, uh, compute where that is with respect to the center of our field of view. We can move the stage to the to the center. So now the object of interest is at the center of our imaging. Now we take the electron image. And now if we're only interested in this one cell in the middle, then uh, we can really crop down to that. If, it, if it's a long cell like a neuron that's wandering around, we can move the stage. And so we only acquire the data that we need to. Um, so that's one of the hardware things that we're working on. But now I'll, I'll skip back to the analysis since that's what uh, I put in the abstract. Um, so the, this bit of developing a system that can process this data more uh, efficiently. So um, what does process the data mean? Uh, so we want to extract meaning. I'm oh, sorry, you might hear my dog barking in the background. Somebody just knocked on the door. Um, apologies. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So we want to extract some sort of meaning. So we want to measure things, right? So um, maybe does this drug treatment affect the cell division in cancer cells? So we might be able to interrupt tumor growth, or can we look at the shape of a particular cell to, to um, diagnose a particular disease? And, and to be able to do this, uh, we need to find the object and separate it from everything else. And this is a process we call segmentation. So for example, here, here's a, a single cell. You can see the nucleus in the middle and this flashing green is the nuclear envelope, which surrounds the nucleus. And this is a particular interest in a lot of disease studies because defects in this can cause lots of diseases or uh, can be an indicator of um, other things going on. Okay, so that's great. You can't do this in 2D. So a, a 2D view, of a 3D scene can mislead you. So you really need to see the full picture. So you need to see this whole thing in 3D. So it's very important. I, I think a photographer asked Prince William here how many children he was going to have or something like that. So it's, um, yeah, e either response maybe is uh, valid. Okay, so back to this. Now we've got this cell might be 300 slices uh, in the serial block face SEM, it might be thousands of slices in other microscopes. And we need to do this process, find this um, structure of interest in every slice. And then we can get to something like this. So now, once we've got this, we can do some analysis. We can measure the volume or the surface area or the surface roughness or the distance between objects and, and things like that. So we really wanna automate this because one overnight acquisition might contain tens or hundreds of these structures that we want to analyze and we just can't do them quickly enough. Uh, but understanding images is easy, right? So back in the 60s, when they first dreamt up the, the topic of artificial intelligence, um, the, the early pioneers, people like Seymour, Papert and uh, Marvin Minsky, um, they saw visual processing as such an easy task. They made a project just to keep their summer students busy for a year or for a summer. Um, so basically said, yeah, this is easy to conceptualize and break down, get them working on it, they'll all work together, and then we'll uh, develop pattern recognition. Obviously, we still haven't solved this very well, so it was a bit harder than they thought. It's also a bit annoying when you see things like this. So a few years ago, um, an experiment trained a cohort of, I think it was about 10 pigeons to look at pathology slides. Uh, and it turns out that when you average over 10 pigeons, uh, they're as good as um, an expert in detecting whether that slice has cancer in it or not. So again, like we should be able to do this, right? If a bunch of pigeons can do it, we should be able to do it. Um, but in traditional methods, it's very hard to tell your computer how to do this, right? So the way we fall back on doing this often, um, still probably the major way of doing this sort of analysis, is somebody like Anne here sits at a tablet screen and draws around things. And it's very, very time consuming. So, you know, it just takes a long time, maybe days or weeks or months. We've had some projects where it's effectively taken years of person time to, to analyze for, you know, one figure in a paper. 
so it's um it's and it's only getting worse with these new automated microscopes and so it, it means that a lot of this beautiful rich data we get just isn't really mined for any sort of meaningful amount of information so um we want a better way okay so this sounds like a job for deep learning i guess a lot of the audience are probably familiar with this um it's really revolutionized a lot of image analysis tasks and the hope is that it can be trained to generalize well um in the way that an expert can generalize can recognize the nuclear envelope in images from different types of electron microscope for example for anyone not familiar the, the way the way it works um or machine learning in general uh is that you, you take this sort of classical paradigm of i've got some data and i try to think up some clever rules to get some answers that tell me what i want to find out um about the 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 data it flips this on its head now i get um the data and then some set of answers and i use that to work out what the rules were such that i can then take those rules and apply them to another data set and they should give me good answers um so the the problem here is this so you need to supply a lot of answers a lot of the sort of training data for most of the um sort of common uh supervised machine learning methods that, that people use uh, and for us this might look something like this so we have a section of cell and there's the nuclear envelope here somebody sat, sits down and traces you know that's that's the stuff that i want you to identify and then you send it to the computer along with many many other um examples like this and the computer learns to to uh reproduce the same answers and the way we get this is we're back to advanced coloring in so somebody sits at a screen traces these um bits of training data and just getting enough training data becomes a problem we want to do the best science so we want to use the best methods for doing things currently the best method is often still um human analysis so manual analysis um so in that case we want to do the best science we can so we should use humans but we've got a lot of images so we need a lot of humans that's the uh, logical conclusion here so we sort of we we're asking ourselves what do you need to do to be able to make this type of training data do you always need a phd to do this so if the question is you know find the um endoplasmic reticulum in the sheet morphological domain then that there's you know there's some amount of knowledge you need to be able to unpack that and trace those objects if you can phrase a question like if you see something like this draw around it um then you don't need a phd to be able to do that and and you call this maybe a, a human easy computer hard type problem um and there's this field of crowdsourcing or citizen science that's grown up uh, around this type of um problem uh so one of the earliest for image-based analysis was something called Galaxy Zoo, which I guess started, oh, it's probably 10, 12, 14, something like that years ago. Um, and astronomers have a similar problem to microscopists. They have automated systems that churn out millions and millions of images every night. And they want to ask questions about those images. So for example, are there more elliptical galaxies than spiral galaxies? Or are there more left spiral galaxies than right spiral galaxies? And that's a really hard thing to automate. Um, but a, a person can do it very easily. Uh, and so they set up this um, project. So um, a guy called Chris Lintot at the University of Oxford um, set up this website along with some colleagues and cropped up their images, presented uh, a galaxy in the middle and just a simple uh, web interface for people to say okay it's of this type or i don't know or no it's a defective image or, or something like that so um as galaxy zoo got many many users it developed into something called the zooniverse and they have many many projects uh all through the sciences astronomy ecology um uh there's there's a handful of biology and health 
uh, ones on there, but not so many yet. Um, it's growing. Uh, for example, uh, one of the kind of image analysis projects that people are working on is this thing called Snapshot Serengeti, where they've just got thousands of camera traps spread around the Serengeti. Uh, it takes lots of images. A lot of them are really bad quality. You know, it's maybe just a, the tail end of an animal or it's in some funny pose and it's very hard to get the computer to recognize it. But actually, a bunch of people are quite good at recognizing things and they just tick, you know, it's this animal with a goal to onwards developing some computational method of, of doing the same. Uh, another one, uh, one that released about the same time as our project is Bash the Bug, and they just, I think, yesterday published their first paper in eLife, so do check that out. Um, and this was looking at um, antibiotic resistance in TB um, by looking at um, various doses of antibiotics uh, in an array of um, dishes like this, and then just working out which is the one where it's all gone and that's the minimum dose that, that we can uh, use for treating this. Uh, and then about the same time as Bash the Bug, we released our project um, called Etch-A-Cell. So there's a, a bitly link here, which links to our um, Etchiverse. So various projects that we've got running at the moment. And what we've done is it's kind of a bit harder than some of the object recognition type um, projects that are out there. Um, so what we do is we ask people to, uh, we give them a small amount of training and then ask them to draw a line on a particular structure. So here it's a nuclear envelope. Uh, we've since done projects where we ask them to delineate the mitochondria. Um, we've got uh, various sort of multi-organelle projects and endoplasmic reticulum. And one thing that having this sort of approach, getting this out to the general public is I think there's a there's a really nice outreach element to it. So we're, we're doing the best science we know how to do with it. So we, we're doing things that we can't do without, but actually also um, the general public are seeing real data and helping with the research, not just seeing press release of, you know, institute director in a suit and tie saying, look how clever we are. This is actually seeing the kind of sometimes messy, dirty data that you have to scientists wrestle with for most of their time. Um, we've had some school teachers using this in class to help teach about cells. You have to, the, the motivation is a bit different. So the students haven't necessarily gone there of their own free will. So we do get some occasional bits of graffiti. So you have to watch out for the kids at the back. But thankfully, we can, um, we can deal with this sort of uh, contribution. And we've taken this to various kind of outreach and public engagement events. So uh, as I said, we're um, Cancer Research UK funded, so um, we've taken them to some CR UK events. We've been to various museums around London, Natural History Museum. Uh, this is um, at the Crick in our exhibition space. This is the Mayor of London, which was a great coup to get um, Sadiq Khan to come and, and annotate for us. Um, and, and the way, it, the, the general idea behind this citizen science method is each image, maybe we expect each volunteer to not be as good as an expert that's reasonable so what we do is we show the same image to many people and we try to aggregate the responses in a way that produces a useful result so this is a, a set of the annotations on one slice so you see some of them are quite good some quite bad um, there's a graffiti one and so it, it's a it's a mixed bag and there, there's a there's a very important question that we had to answer up front which was if there's some you know correct answer ground truth which you know nobody ever quite attains but our experts hopefully are very close to it if the non-expert contributions are all the way down here then there's nothing you can do to make it as good as the experts and so you just have to stick with only the experts doing it uh, thankfully what we find is although some are not as good um, there are some who are as good and the distribution is such that um, in aggregate, they are as good as experts doing it and much faster. So the, the kind of method that we've uh, used for aggregation, or we've actually developed several, but this is the sort of the main one that we, we used in our published work was, so we have our set of 15 or 30 different lines and we want to somehow find the average. One thing you can do is um, kind of flood fill each 
make an island from them around the edge of the island you have some sort of cliff edge and halfway up that cliff is where you can define your sort of consensus of where the inside and outside are separated and so you can get this kind of single contour and if we run that data run that method over the contributions to the 18 different uh, cells that we put up on this universe then we get things that look pretty good pretty reasonable so there's there's bits that obviously people struggled with and there was some obviously something strange happening in, in some places but actually um, these are all nuclei or partial nuclei that the citizens have uh, annotated each one made of around 300 slices so each one would have been a week well for several days full time of somebody's ex expert time to, to produce each one so that's great that's faster than our sort of expert throughput but we still acquire data much faster than that so this is where we now can plug into the the deep learning uh, methods so uh for anyone who's done any image analysis with deep learning you're probably familiar with something called the unit so it's a particular type of convolutional neural network um, that has a particular structure that takes an input image and returns an output image hopefully showing the delineations that you're interested in um, this work was started by uh, for us this was uh, a sandwich student who worked with us this is harry songhurst uh, he came as an undergraduate student I, I believe this is called parallel computing that he's doing here um, but he developed this first um, unit for us and then it since got picked up by the scientific computing team at the crick um, and, and something we found so you know we, we compile in this data and we can get some nice results but something we found was that um, there are particular parts that were causing problems for the prediction so um, if we're interested in the nuclear envelope if we cut the nuclear envelope um, very obliquely then instead of being a nice sharp line like this it becomes very diffuse I think you can even see some nuclear pores here because we've cut it in the plane of the nucleus and that's very hard um for people to sort of say oh where should i where should i draw the line for this um for this object it's very easily missed with a typical workflow if you try and build um sort of a classical image analysis workflow to detect this then it will typically fail at these points when you normally try to flood fill and it just leaks out through here so we uh, we worked on a, a method uh of predicting over different views so we still only train on one view but we predict over orthogonal views and what we find is that the errors it makes so each view makes errors but they're in different places so when you sum them you get um some something that that kind of makes up for the gaps in each so you can see there's gaps in each of these ones but when you combine them um it's pretty good at, at capturing the whole object so here's the same in 3d so the where the red and the green agree it looks yellow where the blue and the green agree it looks cyan where the red and the blue agree it looks magenta so that's a kind of visualization of where the the different views are able to um, or where they make mistakes and and are um corrected by the other views okay so now now we've got um we've got our full deep learning pipeline with the tri-axis prediction um and now we went back and we compared this to some ground truth expert data so on the left so this will scroll through um the same slices with the expert annotations the aggregated citizen science annotations and then the deep learning predictions here and so you can see um that they all look pretty similar we look in 3d then actually there's a few little tiny glitches here and there um that you know we can always be solved by getting even more training data but actually generally these are, are very satisfactory results for the sort of analysis we want to do and really nice thing about convolutional neural networks is th this is a 
130 gigabyte data set that was acquired overnight. Now we can run this convolutional network on a nice big GPU, uh, predicting over this data. Uh, even down here, you can see this is a dividing cell. So we didn't train it on any dividing cells, but it's able to find fragments of nuclear envelope. It's not expecting it to be a continuous um, contained object like a lot of classical algorithms might do. And this now takes the, the deep learning prediction part takes about an hour and then a few hours of post-processing. So now we're in the territory of being able to do this effectively in real time at the rate that we um, acquire the data. Uh, and then going back to this kind of view, you can see this, the tri-axis prediction makes these look a, a little bit smoother than the predictions. Um, it hasn't got those kind of glaring errors that the aggregated citizen science had. Um, if we take a look at this one, then you can see the, um, the citizen scientists weren't able to deal with these very oblique slices through, um, through the plane of, of the membrane, but the triaxis prediction is able to recover those, even though it didn't see any training data in that view to, to deal with it. So the, the, the y-axis and x-axis views were able to correct for the errors uh, in the um, imaging direction. And when we compare this to the few um, expert segmentations that we have, we get, there's a lot of different metrics you can use for measuring things because we're interested here in a membrane. Um, we went for something called the Hausdorff distance, which is kind of the, um, a measure of the distance of one line from another rather than overlapping areas, which this, um, this method gets you know, 0.99999 because the areas are huge compared to the errors. Um, but the the average distance of the uh, machine learning prediction from the expert is less than two pixels. So it's 20 nanometers in this acquisition scale. Uh, so this was work that we published last year, just over a year ago uh, in traffic. It's open access. Uh, all the data and code is available openly. The big data set is up on uh, repositories. So if anybody would like to have a go at um, working on their own algorithms, then please do download it. I think there's a DOI attached to that as well. So do cite it if you use it. Um, okay, so that's great. So we, we've sort of done pretty well on the nuclear envelope. Uh, that's not the only thing we want to study. So ideally, we don't want to start from scratch on the next thing we want to analyze. So we looked into ways of reusing the model, the trained model that we got for this uh, nuclear envelope. And um, the way these machine learning systems work is uh, the, the trained network, even though it's only output the nuclear envelope, it's kind of um, learned a lot of detail about the pixel intensity distributions and so on within that type of data. So it's not so hard to go from that to a model that predicts other things that are in the same type of data. Um, so there's different ways of doing this. What, what we did for sort of purposes of uh, being quite quick is we, we used the tr fully trained nuclear envelope model and then onwards trained it on some new um, uh, different on data for a different organelle, which uh, we chose to be mitochondria. And the, the forum where we did this was um, the ISB conference, which is one of the big um, medical imaging conferences, uh, ran the Mito EM challenge. So it was a volume EM data set that they put up. Uh, they give you uh, half of the volume of uh, ground truth that their team have produced and they keep half of it back for uh, ranking purposes. And um, the challenge was put out to the community to come up with algorithms for segmenting mitochondria from two different data sets. So uh, rat brain tissue and human brain tissue. Uh, there's a sneaky little word in here. So instant segmentation is different to what I've shown you so far. Uh, so what instant segmentation is Instead of um, what we did with the nuclear envelope, we just label these pixels are part of the nuclear envelope. So if I were to do that with these um, mitochondria, so these pixels are part of the mitochondria. So that's a semantic segmentation. Uh, what instant segmentation is, is saying that's mitochondria in one, that's mitochondria in two, and so on. And so you can 
individually separate out the, the separate objects. And the way we did this was um, by predicting the, the area of um, the body of the object and the boundary of the object. Um, we turned to our tri-axis prediction again. So um, the, the different views still, on, still only training. Uh, so we have our trained nuclear envelope model onward trained with the small amount of ground truth that the organizers provided with us. Um, and then uh, the prediction was run over three axes, which involved a little bit of rescaling to, to make it uh, work in the same model. And you can see, you know, what one view, you, you get gaps, but when you combine the three different views, then if one of them separates the object in the correct place, then you can um, uh, combine in, in a way that you get a good instance segmentation. What this looks like is, uh, so this is the rat brain tissue. So in green here is the uh, boundary um, segmentation. In magenta is the, um, the area of the mitochondrion. And we scroll through, you can see it's kind of a bit noisy. There's patches, but we use a three-dimensional uh, convolutional neural network. So uh, an artifact on one slice can be corrected for by its neighboring slices in any prediction. And then when you take this, um, make a 3D model out of this, then you get these really nice instance segmentation maps of the mitochondria. So these are individual mitochondria in rat brain tissue. Uh, on the human brain tissue, this is really noisy data. So scroll through this, there's all sorts of imaging artifacts from the, the way the data was acquired. But again, one of the big advantages of um, the sort of machine learning, deep learning, is that you, you can direct the model to learn that those things aren't important in making the decisions on how to, to label structures. And again, you can see uh, nice gratuitous 3D rendering. Uh, and we put this out as a preprint um, just exactly a year ago. There you go. Um, and again, this is all uh, code and data openly available. Uh, so please have a look. It's by no means the, uh, the only way you could approach this sort of problem, but it is a way that worked quite well for us. Uh, there were people above us in the leaderboard, so we'll, we're looking to uh, incorporate some of the other clever methods that other people have used. Um, and I think more or less there now. So the, the next steps, so now we're getting quite good at segmenting. I think the next steps are now we want to do this quantification that I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, how do we quantify whether this is a, a lumpier nucleus than the nucleus that was treated with a particular drug or, or, or something like that. So the way we're looking to do this is to um, perhaps convert to meshes and use some uh, mesh computations to, to do slightly more efficient um, morphometric measurements. Um, one of the things that's plagued electron microscopy for a long time is that it's very much, or it's very often an N equals one imaging modality. So it's so enormously hard to do one set of images on one sample that, um, you know, it's very hard to get statistics about the distribution of a particular feature of interest. So um, the idea here is that we can automate this whole pipeline from segmentation through to quantification and comparisons um, in a much more efficient way. And then that opens up a whole new uh, area of electron microscopy analysis because, yeah, quite, quite often it is this N equals one. And just to wrap up, um, so this is an interdisciplinary audience. So, um, so for a long time, you know, I was brought up with science is, you know, you're a physicist or you're a chemist or you're a biologist or, you know, so on. Uh, that's not true anymore, right? It's, um, it's, all, it's all just science. Everything contributes, nothing's better than anything else. Um, and particularly in the project I've shown you, you know, for, in the sociology and psychology, we've got to deal with things like how do we engage our citizen scientists? How do we keep them coming back? Because the best ones are the ones who've done it many times, not the people who come and do it once and then never come back. 
um, we had biologists coming up with the questions, preparing the samples. Um, we have chemists developing the fluorescent molecules that we could use in our um, new hardware that we've been developing. Uh, physicists designing microscopes to do new types of imaging. Uh, mathematicians and computer scientists doing this algorithm design that we need to process these huge amounts of data. Um, and here's my final slide. So yeah, it's, it's a huge amount of people have contributed to various parts of this. Um, we've got a big shout out to the machine learning team at the, at the Quick, so led by Amy. Uh, so Yoast, Luke and John have worked on lots of our projects and having proper software engineers working on things is crucial for, for the sustainability of this sort of work. And I will wrap up there, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, that was that was fantastic. Uh, it seems. Uh, I mean, first of all, thanks very much for all the XKCD comics. I did really, really did enjoy them. Uh, and second of all, it seems that you not only have achieved the, the truly big data, but you also have achieved the big annotations through your citizen science project. Science project. Yeah. 